And we're live. Howdy. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being patient. How's my audio been? Oh, great. It's good. How's mine? You sound good. Everyone says Clear. I'm quiet, but then like I hear myself and I'm like, I'm I'm too loud, I think. But no. Everyone here is okay. Thanks for joining us tonight. Moon Day. Uh, it's been a long time. You know, mm-hmm. Longo's a traveling man, you know? Yeah. The wanderer. Um, but yeah, excited to be here. See what you have to talk about. Uh, maybe sure. at, the, at the end of this, we'll engage with some of these, some of these peeps. Get some. Yeah. Yeah. Here. We'll take, we'll take some calls for sure. Um, yeah. It's going to be your, you're going to be responsible for shutting me up and making sure we have time. Cause every time we, we try to do that, we just like leave five minutes, <laughs> which is never. Okay. Enough. That's fine. Do you have a cutoff point? At, um, uh, midnight? Like, like nine o'clock my time, which is pretty late. So. Which is two hours 11. from now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two hours from now. Yep. Okay. So that'd be so, midnight on my end. Yeah, That's I know. cool. It's late for you. I know. Late for both of us. I, I'm usually asleep by now, so. So, so um, <clears throat> well, first off, good to see you again. Yeah, you ben, too. And then uh, glad to, um, feels good to have both just you and I here. And um, I think we'll go tit for tat uh this episode i'll uh i hope so yeah i'll yeah, show and, you something and, and then you show me something <laughs> yeah that sounds great and it's been it's you know and like i said i've started this whole journey with you you know and having my own channel now and kind of being able to at least have these things that me and you talk about privately slowly making their way into video format and mm-hmm. you know having a kind of a reference has been really nice and it's it's been a lot of work surprisingly a lot amount of work i mean i guess that's not that surprising but when you got three kids and full-time job it's finding time can be really hard so but yeah now a lot of that to you so yeah i, I wish we do this like every week but oh, yeah. finding time to do it once a month is hard so i've got some time now that i'm uh nested up but like ben said and everyone out there I've been on the road for last three weeks, four weeks, I guess, maybe more. But um, yeah, I'm staying at a house right now, so I've got Wi-Fi. I'm going to be streaming a little bit more often the next week or two. But uh, yeah, what do you want to get into? I'm just excited. I mean, is it stuff you've been reading or is it just stuff you're coming across on your journey? I got something. Yeah, yeah. So I I found one a couple days ago, and uh, it was like a snippet. I don't think it's an article. It's more of a snippet. Yeah. But uh, I've just got... been loving. I've just been loving that that it's it's funny. More and more people are like clipping newspapers recently. You know, especially you. Oh yeah. Maybe this isn't a newspaper, but you know. No, you started. You a... me... Yeah. No, you started. You started a renaissance. Yeah, it's been fantastic. It's crazy. I, I, Most of my emails are people sending me newspaper clippings. Oh, it's pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. So that's great. I love it. It's great to see. I went and bought a uh, subscription to the Tampa Bay Times. You got to. And, yeah. Some of them, that, that's the only yeah. way to get them. It's annoying. That gave me access to a lot of different Florida papers. But, um, here, I'll see if I can present this one. Since I know you cover a lot of strange creatures, monsters, things of that sort. Jeff, could you pass me my water? Sure. Please. Oh, I think I've I think I've heard about this one. Have you? Yeah. Oh, there's yeah. a drop left. Yeah. This yeah. one's pretty pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I have heard this one. Yeah. I haven't seen this exact article, but but yeah. There you know, the I gotta do a sea serpent. Um, swamp serpent video yes. sometime because they oh, have yeah. like dog heads and horse heads and all these different. There's so many different kinds. It's pretty crazy. Oh, Anyways, yeah. yeah, please jump in. Sure. <clears throat> so, Florida monster slain. An enormous reptile. I think that's reptile. Yeah. More like the mythical dragon than a land serpent. 
has been killed by a hunter in the lower Everglades. For 100 years, it has not only been a tradition among the Seminole Indians who inhabited the borders of Lake Okeechobee, the bo but it is stated as fact within the knowledge of some of the Indians now living that an immense serpent made its home in the Everglades and has carried off at least two Indians. Hmm. And just, you know, real quick note here. I, I click, clipped off the date. Oh, wait, no, no, this is 1902. Okay, so March 6th, 1902. Nice. So the, the whole, why I'm saying that is these people know what a... Oh, yeah, yeah, of um, course. They know what an alligator is. They of know course. what a or they know what a 10 foot rattlesnake is. You know, they mm -hmm. know what a runaway. I don't know if they have seen a python or an anaconda, but they know what snakes are. These people oh, yeah. are, you know, this isn't like a f first European landing and like, oh, my God. No, look at no, that. Yeah, of course. This is. Just... Yeah, I mean, and, you know, you've you've shared a lot about the, the giant alligators of Florida that oh, yeah. and you, you remember that article i shared with you about that giant alligator found in in um new jersey with the arabic coins mm -hmm. found below it so i yeah. mean and like we've been saying too florida was america america was called florida and yes, sir. the pen peninsular florida was called cape florida or oh yeah uh, peninsular florida whatever it was and now you're you're really gonna like this one because yeah. of the tie-in no, 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 no. The Mayan? The no, go on, go on. Yeah. Oh, it's just crazy. And you know, we've I've been saying so long that the whole world was, you know, and this goes back to what we've been saying, you know, for anyone that's kind of new to me in Longo's conversations, you know, we've been saying that before probably before the last major ice event, the whole world was a similar weather, you know, tropical for the most part. And that alligators, you know, the 30 foot alligators of peninsular Florida extended all the way up into Canada. And, um, mm. you know, you find coral in Alaska everywhere, all over, um, you know, Nova Scotia and so on. Tropical coral, you know, obviously there's cold water coral, but tropical coral is the key part there. Mm. And that, you know, the, the Gulf of Mexico was notorious for growing really, really large animals. Of all kinds, um, mm -hmm. you know, some of the best fishing was there, and um, yeah, even articles from the 1700s. They knew what a sea, what a serpent was, and they knew, you know, they knew the difference between an alligator and a serpent, and all these things. And you know, I have some cool ones from the 1700s where 50 feet of the serpent is out of the water, so they're estimating, you know, for that much of it to be exposed, that it was probably 200 feet long. Yeah. So yeah. Anyways, I'm Crazy. talking over you. So yeah, keep going. No, no, no worries. <clears throat> but um, what I was going to say is obviously from the um, illustration, this thing had Chinese dragon esque uh, whiskers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell yeah. telltale Chinese dragon. I love type. it. Yeah, because they in some of the older ones they call them like catfish heads. Right. You know, the whiskers of a catfish look very much like the dragon-esque Chinese drawings. And yeah. Uh, first thing I noticed was that that's that's when you know this thing is in the swamp, you know, in the Everglades, because they have to have those mm -hmm. feelers. Oh, yeah, slow-moving water. Slow-moving mm -hmm. water is um, a telling sign of those uh, whisker-type things. Yeah, Not I always, love catfish. Usually. So, recently, Buster Farrell, or Farrell, one of the boldest and most noted hunters in the Okeechobee, who for 20 years has made the border of the lake and the Everglades his home on one of his periodical expeditions into one of those lonesome wilds, noted that when he supposed to be the path, noted that what he supposed to be the pathway of an immense gator. For several days, he visited the locality for the purpose of killing the Saurian, like Saurian, Saur. That's a um, key word. And you yes. know, with all the dinosaur, dinosaur. I talk about. Yeah. This is where it gets obfuscated and the dinosaur narrative comes from. They were all Saurians. They were all lizardy snakes. They weren't 
these weird shaped dinosaurs we see in Mm -hmm. you know fantasy of today they were similar in ways but very different in others no they were they were plasma inhabiting animals you can say uh what lives you know you can list off a million species that live in the live in the dirt you can Mm -hmm. list off a million species that live in the water you can list list off a million species that live in the air well that's three of the elements Mm-hmm. What in what inhabits the fire? What yeah. inhabits the lightning? So this is a you know a realm humanity only has glimpses into every so often. So what what at times is physical passes into the realm of imagination. Yeah. You know, you could you could say it's an astrological thing, yeah. but it's not it's not as simple as all these things getting uh killed out, extinct. They did go extinct in the literal sense, but their memory Blah, blah, blah. Let's uh, continue reading. Yeah, I love the plasma idea, though. Yeah, I agree. Because there's, you know, there's been so much talk about that. You know, the plasma, the dragons were were, were plasma serpents mm-hmm. or electrical yeah, it, serpents. It's not so much fire breathing or as it might be <clears throat> fire devouring, mm-hmm. light, light consuming and producing, of course. But yeah, so for several days, he visited the locality for the purpose of killing the Saurian, you can think of Sauron from Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. There's a uh, Saturnian component to that word, Sauron, Saturn, Saurian. And sorry, if you're sorry, that's a very Saturn word. You know, I'm sad, I'm sorry. You know, you, mm-hmm. you, you get it. Melancholy, but, was, yeah. but was unsuccessful in finding him. He studied some plant out with it. A large cypress stood near its pathway, and he concluded the best thing for him to do was best thing for him to do would be to climb this tree and take a stand for his quote gatorship. He accordingly prepared himself and took a prop took a position in the tree. For two days he stood on watch with his rifle ready, but without the desired success. On the third day, before he had been on his before he had been on his perch an hour, he was almost paralyzed <clears throat> by what looked to him like an immense serpent gliding along the supposed alligator track. He estimated it to be anywhere from twenty to thirty feet long and fully ten to twelve inches in diameter, where the head joined the body and as large around as a barrel, 10 feet farther back. Wow. The snake stopped within easy reach of his gun and raised its head to take a precautionary view of his surroundings. As it did, Pharrell opened fire on it, shooting at its head. Taken by surprise, the serpent dashed into the marsh at railroad speed, while Pharrell kept a fire on it until he had emptied the magazine of his rifle but failed to stop it almost four days afterward he ventured back into the neighborhood to see how things were and about a mile from where he first saw the snake he saw a large flock of buzzards he went to see what they were after and there he found the creature dead and its body badly its body so badly torn by the buzzards that it was impossible to save the skin. He, however, secured its head. It is truly a frightful-looking object, fully ten inches from jaw to jaw, with ugly, razor-like teeth. He described the animal as a dark color on the back, with dingy white beneath, and with feelers around its mouth, similar to catfish he has now he has now gone back into the swamp with the intention of securing the skeleton and bringing it back after which he will send it to the hmm smithsonian institution in washington of course scientists who have investigated the matter are convinced that the animal is not a land serpent the latest society fad among the fat oh no, no that's the next article well, there you go. Florida monster slain. Sent to the Smithsonian. Never heard from again. 
Yep. Yeah, we've heard that a million times, haven't we? Yep. Yeah, that just reminds me of uh, one I shared about Washington. That's like eerily similar. The natives were scared of a lake. Um, yeah, that's great. I mean, so much of the, you know, the Everglades were, you know, a mysterious place. And, uh, you know, when you got 30 foot alligators, you imagine how much larger everything else has to be, you know, just to survive in a place like that. Crazy. I, yeah. As if there weren't enough things to make the, make swimming in Florida scary. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, well, so, since that was just uh, so reminiscent of one that I shared a long time ago, um, I'll just share this one that's almost identical, but on the other side of the U.S., if that sounds good to you. Fuck yeah. Throw it out. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you don't have to go far back, you know, and and for anyone that uh, hasn't seen any of my Anomalous America episodes, I talk about large Saurians in almost every episode. <laughs> And um, I'm not sure if I got into it in my last in New Mexico. I think I did. I talked about a 115 foot lizard. And then um, in Colorado, there was a good one. It was a hundred plus foot lizard that had a um, 10 foot um, animal in its stomach. And inside of its stomach, it had giant um, seeds or pine cones, you know, huge. So we're talking really big trees too, you know. It was like mm-hmm. a double decker. This article, you know, because <laughs> it was talking about giant seeds, giant pine cones, and huge lizards. Thing was, thing was eating pine cones like they were granola. <laughs> yeah, and it was like as you know, and in the same article, they found um, petrified coconuts that were like you know more than three mm-hmm. times as big. And when he broke it open, it was all quartz inside. God damn! Ooh, so I got some. How cool would that be uh, to find? Oh, yeah. And, and you're, he said you can still love. see. We well, got some stuff along those lines to share too. I was just gonna say petrified clam shells with quartz calcite on the inside in my oh, yeah. video video premiering tomorrow night. Oh sweet, guys! Yeah, I'll, I'll be watching that one then. Um, oh, so sure, yeah. I've shared this one on the Washington Washington episode of Anomalous America, um, uh, Great Western Lake, Arizona, eighteen ninety four. Um, I'll just read this county in Washington subjected to violent upheavals, volcanic or shrinking of the planet, tropical garden. Again, same thing. Guard. They called this the garden of Edens. The, the native Americans called this the garden of Eden. Um, dismembered bas- pyramids of basalt, you know, a whole basalt pyramid had been crumbled and fallen and the stone were scattered all over the ground and an entire Indian tribe eaten alive by a giant reptile. <laughs> um, here's what it looked like. So I shared this. This is a lake that took up the majority of what is British Columbia and and Washington State and Oregon as well. And um, this is when this there was some kind of event. Um, obviously, you know, earthquake, volcanic, that pushed a large amount of this water east and caused a lot of, uh, you know, um, Noah deluge like um events and one of the first articles i read on my thc interview was covering crazy animals like we're mentioning now all being shoved into a cave like you know imagine a giant wave full of animals you know and then they hit a mountain and everything gets shoved into this cave and in this cave this man this man found um all kinds of crazy shit, you know, wolverines, hyenas, um, wolves that are four times as big as normal wolves. They he found birds that had fifty foot wingspans, and he found man. So man was alive, as we've talked about a lot before, long ago. But for mm-hmm. people that are kind of new to what I think, and at least some of our older conversations, um, I tend to side a lot with Edgar Casey when he talks about Atlantis. And that the Atlanteans weren't necessarily fighting wars with men, but they were fighting wars with giant animals, hmm. predominantly of the sea, right? Poseidon, you know, and right. um, yeah, huge monsters, you know, two, three, four hundred foot. And the largest 
geological record I've ever found was a 900 foot reptile they found in Mongolia, I mean, Godzilla esque. Anyways, back to the Jesus. article real quick. Since we're just talking about reptiles, I'll just skip ahead. An Indian legend of this remarkable lake makes it the home of a monstrous sea serpent. So when this lake closed, got closed off or disconnected from the ocean, which happens a lot, these animals get stuck in them. You know, Loch Ness. There's, there's stories like this in many, many of these deep lakes. <clears throat> the remnants of the red tribes, which used to frequent its shores, tell their white neighbors that no Indian can venture into the water either for a bath or a pleasure trip in a canoe without being swallowed whole by the hideous reptile. <laughs> And to this day, the Aborigines look upon Rock Lake with the same apprehension that an old-time Orthodox ponders over the terrors of purgatory. Their legend declares that an entire tribe was lashed to destruction and eaten not many centuries ago, all to satisfy the greed of this very monster. At another time, during the outbreaks quelled by Colonel Steptoe in 1858, a band of noble redmen in their efforts to escape the violence of Uncle Sam's blue coats, tried to conceal themselves above the lake in a little paradise, but were overtaken by the great fish in the le legend of vows and sent to eternity. Buh, 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 buh. And they say, yeah, it doesn't really go too much farther from that, but yeah, giant reptile. And I have tons like this. So again, if, if you're new to my material, um, you can just search my Twitter here. Um, you just type in my name here, right? Search my name, type, oh, uh, yeah. or type monster or whatever you want to type. And make sure you can spell unlike me. Um, but yeah, I mean, here's my 120 foot dragon found in Utah. Um, here's the reptile in, in, uh, in Colorado, 117 feet, several hundred pounds of bones removed. Another animal 10 feet long in its stomach. <laughs> petrified nuts, larger than a pint cup. Of tropical <laughs> climate. You say petrified nuts. <laughs> yeah, so since we talked about the Smithsonian, right? This is a perfect transition. Um, the Smithsonian, this is an article from uh, 1919. Okay, the Smithsonian offers a $5 million bounty for oh, a huge yeah. reptile, 1919. That's a shitload of money in 1919, right? Yeah. Accompanied by Laddie, a German war dog, whom he captured on the Western Front, Captain Lester Stevens will leave London on Christmas Eve for Central Africa and search for the Brontosaurus, a prehistoric monster, for possession of which, according to the Daily Mail, the Smithsonian Institution offers $5 million. Laddie will be employed to find the f and follow the trail of the monster. The Brontosaurus was seen in the Congo recently by the Belgian explorer Gapelli, LePage, and others. Captain Stevens believes the reptile is hiding in the subterranean sea in Central Africa. He is taking with him a manlicher, a giant rifle, and a Winchester repeater, and a double-barreled shotgun, and a forty-five caliber revolver. Damn. Walter Sinus, famous hunter of big game who has... Sounds like a Netflix movie. <laughs> oh, dude, for sure. I mean, you know, these articles are... There have so many that could be movies easily, obviously, but... But yeah, this is, you know, and I have... I'm, I already have probably, you know, 50 to 60 good articles pieced together, and I'll probably do, you know, a little series on the Smithsonian and, and Mr. Smithsonian himself, and, you know, he was just a trust fund baby who was obsessed with subterranean worlds like the, uh, the inner earth was his real jam and he was a relic hunter you know it's kind of like indiana jones you know and uh he just had really deep pockets and then he he you know he got in bed with um i'm spacing the name of the the royal society um of england their exploratory society but, uh, you know, once he got in bed with them, they just pooled their money and they basically bought up everything. And, you know, in my Anomalous America, Colorado episode, the governor of Colorado was pleading with the, the U.S. government because the Smithsonian was stealing all the mummies from Colorado and shipping them to Europe. Mm -hmm. And this is an article. He's like, the government has to help me. There are no laws against this. And he even says in the article, they're tearing down the buildings they're stealing all of the relics. And he wasn't just talking about Colorado. He was talking about Arizona, 
but they collect, you know, bones of dino- of saurians, and they just steal it all. So whoever they couldn't steal from, they just paid them off. And that that uh, 120 foot dragon in Utah, same thing. The guy the guy who found it flat out said he's like, well, the Smithsonian offered me more money than any of you. <laughs> so Damn. you know, Those motherfuckers. Yeah, and he, I think it was like I can't remember what it was. It was it was a shitload of money. I think it was like. Fifty thousand dollars is what they offered him, and this is in eighteen ninety four. So, so uh, well, well, yeah. So that just got, led me on a on a tangent there, but that's but a yeah. fucking good one, man. You uh, you ready for one? Absolutely, yeah. Sharing all. Okay, let's see if I can. Hope everyone's doing well. Shitload of people watching as usual. I'm sure the majority are here for the long go but i'm just grateful to be a part of this and i miss our talks as usual and the, you know a great crowd on a monday night is always fantastic and i hope everyone's enjoying what, what they're uh hearing so far yeah suppose according to my um according to my analytics which i like never look at um, oh this is a good i have this exact one <laughs> monday monday night is supposedly like my my uh you know, um, dude, I, I was know. just talking to a, a follower about this exact article. This is on really? my Twitter about yeah. them milking the sloths. giant sloths. Yeah. Oh my god, this is hilarious. literally today. How funny is that? Yeah, that is pretty exact, crazy. I have this exact clipping on my on my Twitter. Yeah, it's a good one. Okay, so guys, before we <laughs> read this one, just so everyone knows, you know, some people say, "Oh, I don't believe in dinosaurs." I don't believe in dinosaurs, right? I think we covered. <laughs> that a little bit um already well it's just a misnomer really really, right yeah it's 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 a way to get people looking in the wrong direction Mm -hmm. or to it's a way to get people to perceive the data perceive the artifacts in a different light and timelines Um, right yes so however you can slap on a bathing suit and a snorkel and go jump somewhere in florida anywhere and pull out one of these things, bones. Seriously. Anyone. Mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, those are large, extinct mammals. Now, that's not a matter of belief. You know, we can go pull those out of the out of the springs, out of the swamp, like I said. Now, this giant sloth would be included in that category. So, let's talk about this. Okay. Mm-hmm. Ex-Home Magazine of the Austin American. The caveman's cow comes to New York. The giant ground sloth gave the primitive prehistoric American caveman 20 times the milk of the choicest modern cow, furnished abundant meat, and enabled him to land an easy life in his rent-free dwelling. You can see that good, right? Oh, yeah. On the yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's, there's there's let's so many good ones about this because you know there were still uh tribes in South America that had a oral tradition of these animals, you know. And yes. Talked yeah. about how they were actually pets and um that they had so many generations of these animals living alongside them that they didn't need pens or anything, that they lived they were it was a mutual relationship. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, for anybody, you know, as a parent, you know, you see all these funny movies and there's a lot of actually really good ones out there that have a lot of really good truths in them, you know. Um, But The Croods is just a funny one and it has a lot of really hidden, not necessarily hidden, but obfuscated truths in that one. But yeah, keep going. Science shows how the Gripotherium or ground sloth gave 20 times the milk of the modern cow to the easygoing primitive Patagonian. The caveman's cow has come to New York. In the main hall of the Museum of National History, within two blocks of white-lighted Broadway, the bossy of the Stone Age that supplied milk to Mr. and Mrs. Stone Hatchet and all the little hatchets is comfortably established in a high, well-lighted hall 
on a platform of mahogany. Blah 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 blah. Do you remember where the uh, good good bits are in this one? Any highlights? That's uh, that's pretty much it. I can't remember. Yeah, it's just kind of a, a rambling. But um, the fact that it's in America, that was the big thing. That's what led me to this because the majority of the stories are from South America. But this animal is found from Alaska to the tip of South America. Yep. Right here. Let's read this little bit down here. This is like a mound complex where they found the thing. Diagram of Consuelo Cove at Last Hope, Patagonia, where the prehistoric remains were found. But yeah, these things are all over Florida, too. Mm -hmm. um, this, was, this was in a Florida newspaper I got this out of, but it was probably circulated in a couple different newspapers. And this but, is um, going kind of backwards on what you touched on and how important it is to highlight these things is that a lot of the reptiles or dinosaurs were actually mammals. And there right. were plenty of scientists who were pointing this out, but they were silenced, you know. Um, you know, the timeline thing, as we've discussed, is a really important part of this all, right? And stretching the dinosaur, the dinosaur stretches the, the timeline narrative back, right? What is it, millions of years, which is just absolute nonsense, you know. And you can just study enough of you know, Florida perspective alone to see that there are a lot of problems in the timeline. And these skeletons obviously are a big part of that, right? And your mammoth, um, your videos about the mammoth are huge on that as well. And it kind of just correlates a lot that um, it brings all this stuff like right up into the 1700s even, even 1800s, right? And your article there was what, 1906, right? With the, the serpent in Florida? I think the dragon two. This one yeah. is 1915. This one is. Yeah. So, uh, but this is skeletons. It wasn't a living creature that they found. No. But the odds no, of them yeah. still being alive somewhere, I would say, it's not. I mean, in this time frame, maybe not now, but in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Oh, um, yeah. Because, you know, like Roosevelt, he traveled the world with these same Smithsonian people. Um, you know, and the barons and the dukes. Do you remember that giant saurian of Alaska that they were hunting? Yes. The, 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 one, that pick, the one that picked up the uh, animal the, with one hand? Yeah, the caribou. Ran and it's off. Off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you had royalty traveling the world to hunt these things, you know? Big game hunting was, like, for the rich. And that was, like, the exclusive yes. thing to do. And uh, yeah, It's like Conan the Barbarian shit. Going oh yeah, boys and oh dude, that's one taking... of the, we. I know our list of uh of movie nights that we never have started and someday we'll get to. Conan's mm. got to be one of them because man, I love them both of them. Yeah, same, same. Yeah, you know my father's Austrian and he was a bodybuilder, so Arnold oh, nice. was a big <laughs> staple in my house. <laughs> but yeah, lot lots of good memories from from the eighties with Arnold. But yeah. And the narrative, the historical narrative of Conan is fantastic, too. I mean, we could highlight on a lot of that, just stuff we talk about on the show. But, yeah. Let's see if... Can I um, present something? Please. Shift, sh shift, shifting gears here. Of course. To a little bit of another one of your favorite topics. And don't worry. Um, I'll reveal it here live. But there's a ton to get into that I, that I can send you afterwards and stuff. Um, and for everybody, crazy, listening, crazy connections, crazy. Connections. We just threw this together. You know, it's, it's yeah. hard. Longo hasn't had internet and you know, I'm so busy. So we're just free balling, shooting from the hip here. So I hope everyone's just going to kind of go with the flow here. It's not a yeah. specific um, layout that we're going with tonight. <clears throat> Yeah, we just talked for like 30 seconds before we uh, went live. But um, I've got a little recording here. This is the first time I've ever done a recording through like no video, just MP3. Can you, is it, does it say if I'm sharing? Um, there we go. And you know, okay. the, you know, one of my favorite words uh -oh. Uh -oh. is in the title. So get that title out here, put it away. <laughs> So, okay. but I have yeah. to, yeah, it has to show it. But anyway, anyone that hasn't seen, I've, I'm, I'm three episodes into my radium series and I'm sure this is going to have some good overlap. 
Oh, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. Everyone's going to love it. Anyone in Florida, I don't know. I might get in trouble for posting this, but uh, don't worry. The person talking at the beginning is Orson Welles. Really? Citizen Kane? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Fantastic. It's not playing. Long go. Can't hear it. Long go. Can't hear it? Nope. Okay. Damn. Nope. Well, you're screen sharing the button instead of the screen, or it's messed up. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Mm. Let me look. Here, I'll. Mm. I see if you can hear here. I can, I could hear it, so let me figure that out. You you present it down at the bottom again. Is there any way you can manipulate those controls? No. Hmm. Damn. All right, well, we're going to take a sec to uh, figure that out. But you can send him the file. I can send you the file. Over iMessage. Shit. Well, uh, fuck. <laughs> How about you talk about something here, Jeff? See if you can figure this out. Yeah. Um, well, where, where have we been since we last talked? Um, I know I mentioned, um, here, I'm just going to share this. You work on your audio. As soon as you get that going, let me know. Um, this is a book I've talked about a lot over the last, I don't know, 10 years, 11 years. Um, and it's a fantastic book. If you're not familiar with the story of Atlantis and Lost Lemuria, you should check it out. It's available on archive internet archive um i just randomly was like oh man i should go back and listen to that audio and uh re-listen to the audiobook a few times and you know how you can come back to things and and hear new hear new parts of the book or be reminded of parts that you didn't touch on and you know anyone that's been following me for a while knows that you know i'm a big uh, theosophy root race guy and um, the subject matter has a lot of overlay with the linguistic stuff that, um, that me and Longo talk about. The book is right here. Story of Atlantis, Lost Lemuria. This is a typo here, but you just search the story of Atlantis and lost the lost Lemuria by Elliot W S published 1896, uh, archive.org. It'll pop right up. There's only one posting of it. It's a quick read. It's 129 pages. Um, it's fantastic though. Um, he touches on so many things, you know, and since I haven't touched the book since I met Longo. So it's like rereading it again. I was like, wow, this is like, you know, stuff that I had read before, but I didn't have all the material to kind of piece it together in the way I do now. And yeah, Tone Aviv, he knows, he knows, he knows what's up. And yeah, this book is just great. Um, I'm just going to kind of touch on a few things that I've highlighted it's just in my private communications with Longo. And um, yeah, so the story of Atlantis. I'm just going to kind of read this. This is like a little introduction here. And then we'll jump around. Um, obviously, you can see my search topic here is, is based on Greek. And um, he makes a lot of really fantastic um, correlations between the Gulf of Mexico, Atlantis, and the origins of the Greek people in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, yeah, and the root races and how they um, evolved from Atlantis and Lemuria and what that has to do with, you know, the American continent and kind of that hidden history, you know, previous, you know, resets, essentially. You know, as the Mayans described, there were four reset events, all um, by a different element. And um, this guy just kind of goes based off that and Boba adds his own. <clears throat> adds his own kind of spin on it. Longo, how's it going? I uh, did pull up the video format so we can give it a go. 
if you if you want. But if you'd like, yeah, because this keep is reading. I'm just going to read. I'm just filling time, and I can touch on okay. this as we get into my article about um, um, the strange hunt for Atlantis. So I'd rather just do them together. So let's give you give your thing a try here, real quick. For sure. Let's, I think the window's down there. Let's give it a go. Okay. Yes. Not hearing anything. Can you hear that? No. No. Could could you see maybe if there's like a an allowance thing on your end? Mm, settings. Audio. Any any uh, computer whizzes? Automatic. The... Just... No. I'm fired. <laughs> there's nothing on my end. Um. Hmm. Okay, I think it's got to be. Whatever, what is it playing through the speakers on your? I think it your... split the audio track in two. I think. So I, think I think it's it split it's... The, it, it separated the audio track from the video. Can you send me files. a link to this and see if yeah. I can play it? Yeah, I'll try sending it to you. Let's try that. Huh. So, anyways, yeah. Um, this is a you can find an audio. There's audio books of this book of this book all over YouTube. There's some really great. Send um, me a link of the video. I'll give you that file. Several several good links to this book. So if you if you can't read or you don't have the time to read and you want an audio book, I think it's only like an hour. You know, maybe a little bit more, 120 pages, and it's fantastic. And it kind of correlates and it has a ton of overlaps. You know, if you've been following Longo or me or both there's going to be a lot of stuff that resonates with kind of what we've been talking about. And uh, yeah, fantastic, quick little reading. A lot of, uh, of the Atlantis books from the 1800s, you know, Ignatius and many others are kind of a hard read, you know, 400 pages or more. So this is a, this is a cool little quick, quick read. Strongly recommend it. But yeah, so send me this link and I'll try to get it to play. I'm just going to read a little bit. And uh, Longo, you just cut me off whenever you feel like I can give it a try. The Story of Atlantis, a Geographical, Historical, and Ethnological Sketch. The general scope of the subject before us will best be realized by considering the amount of information that is obtained about the various nations who compose our great fifth or Aryan race, alien race. That's a word you can't get away with saying too often, so I'm going to be careful with myself there. From the time of the Greeks and the Romans onwards, volumes have been written about every people who in their turn have filled the stage of history. The political institutions, the religious beliefs, the social and domestic manners and customs have all been analyzed and cataloged, and countless works in many tongues record for our benefit the march of progress. Further, it must be remembered that of the history of this fifth race, we possess but a fragment, the record merely of the last family races of the Celtic subrace and the first family races of our own Teutonic stock. But the hundreds of thousands of years which elapsed from the time when the earliest aliens left their home on the shores of the Central Asian Sea to the time of the Greeks and Romans bore witness to the rise and fall of innumerable, innumerable civilizations. Of the first subrace of our alien race who inhabited India and colonized Egypt in prehistoric times, we know practically nothing. And the same may be said of the Chaldean. Babylonian, and the Syrian nations who composed the second sub-race for the fragments of knowledge attained from the recently deciphered hieroglyphics or cuneiform inscriptions of Egyptian tombs or Babylonian tablets may scarcely be said to constitute history. The Persians who belong to the third of the Iranian sub-race have, it is true, left a few more traces, but of the earlier civilizations of the Celtic of the fourth sub-race we have no records at all. It is only with the rise of the last family shoots of the Celtic stock, the Greek and Roman peoples, that we come upon historic times. And, you know, not to go backwards on my anomalous America stuff, but I've been showing a lot over the last few episodes that the Tesian Druids have the most ancient historical presence in Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. And as Longo and I have been talking about Longo for, you know, to much greater detail than me, 
has shown that the Greek, and when you say Greek, you have to think of Etruscan because these are like, you know, races from a from the historical timeline were presented that are that are important overlays to remember. And who were the Romans? The original Romans were the Etruscans, and the Greeks and the Etruscans have endless overlays, and they have much more ancient roots here in America, and in the Gulf, and on the Yucatan, and in Florida. That they did, then they do in the Mediterranean. <clears throat> or, I know you're listening long ago. Should we give it a try? Did you send me a link? Yeah. You want to check your Instagram? Yes, of course. Inbox. Might be a way to get it from there to there. So I'm just going to jump ahead to this part real quick. The Basque language oh, stands alone amongst European tongues, having an affinity with none of them. According to the to Farrar, there never has been any doubt that this isolated language, preserving its identity in a western corner of Europe between two mighty kingdoms, resembles in its structure the aboriginal tongues of the vast opposite continent, America, and those alone. Now, Old World Micmac, he's still in here, okay? And people have heard me on your show and on mine talk endlessly about the Micmac and the Basque were allies and the micmac language is you know one of the if not the closest resemblance to to egyptian as we know it that exists in america and the basques and in the micmac um spoke to each other fluently and it's an important thing to remember right because the basque have a very interesting lineage and a very interesting history and some of the purest blood left in the world and by purity i mean they just have what they call blood of their descendants the phoenicians apparently were the first nation in the eastern hemisphere to use a phonetic alphabet now again if you've been listening to us we've 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 talked endlessly that the phoenicians weren't necessarily a race of people or a phenotype even they were a secret society more so or a cargo cult kind of and um yeah their their main trades um you know they were they were they were the mercantile people and you know phoenicians and finnish and when you study etruscan it goes back to the finnish when you study chinese it goes back to the finnish when you study um you know the early roots of the yucatan and the mayan and the aztec it all goes back to the finnish and the etruscan Anyways, they use a phonetic alphabet, the characters being regarded as mere signs for sounds. It is a curious fact that an equally early date, we find a phonetic alphabet in Central America amongst the Mayans of the Yucatan, just like I was saying, whose traditions ascribe the origin of their civilization to a land across the sea to the east. Now, again, when you hear them describing this land across the sea to the east, I've, I've pretty conclusively i think shown along with longo that they're just they're not talking about the mediterranean they're talking about literally peninsular florida that's the land to the east and remember columbus himself said when he landed in cuba that this is asia so we're shrinking everything down you know um america was called india superior it was also called great katai or grand katai or the origins of the chinese race the origins of Mexico are Chinese, and the Chinese language and history of China as we know it today has been completely altered. And the the, the oldest hieroglyphic-based language of the Chinese was Etruscan and Phoenician. La Plagean, sorry, I mutilated that. The great authority on this subject writes, one-third of this tongue, the Mayan, is pure Greek. Who brought the dialect of Homer to America? Or who took to Greece that of the Mayans? Exactly. That's the key. Greek is the offspring of the Sanskrit. Is Maya or are they Covial? Still more surprising it is to find 13 letters out of the Mayan alphabet bearing most distinct relation to Egyptian hieroglyphic signs, just as we were saying with Micmac and as we were describing uh, with the Basque language. This is all the root here. It's all coming from here. That's why, as this guy stated, who brought the dialect of Homer to America or who took to Greece that of the Mayas exactly? Um, 
still more surprising it is to find, right? I already covered that, the Egyptian hieroglyphic signs for the same letters. It is probable that the earliest form of an alphabet was hieroglyphic, the writing of the gods, as the Egyptians called it, and that it developed later in Atlantis into phonetic. Exactly. So, yeah, I'll just pause there, Longo, and I'm going to get your link going. What do you think about what I just read there? I sent this to you already, and we talked about it, so I kind of know how you feel, but tell the audience at least. I think you're muted. Yeah, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. That's uh, something we're going to have to really dive dive deep on is the phonetics, the astrology of all the root race research <clears throat> between Blavatsky, Steiner, those circles. I think from our era, digital era, mm -hmm. with a, with an extra dose of astrological, astro -theolo astro theological perspective, um, like all the keys are already there to unlock all all these mysteries. Um, you know, right there when you were talking, if you replace the word God with goat, with goat, people of the goat, sons of the goat, you know, goat attributes, like a bach beard, the pharaohs, right? Um, this is where you see a lot of your Finnish history, because Finn, Finnish history would have been a local name for themselves. But you have things like got. We, you hear a lot of, this is the, what throws a lot of people off is they'll hear God or gods and they'll say, oh, wait, hang on. This race was gods, that race was gods, you know, hold up. Well, it's goat, the goat. This has a, this denotes an agricultural relationship. It denotes facial hair because the beard comes from the goat, goat genetics so to speak. And um, yeah, a lot of places where you see God, you can replace it with goat. And from goat, you get goth, goth. So Gothberg is the goths. So goth, goat, God, same word. And you were saying Teutonic and Aryan or alias or alien Celtic origins. Well, that goes back to the Goths as well, and the uh, people before the Goths, the goats, people of the goat, they came from somewhere else. They would have been on the other side of the Atlantic as well. Mm -hmm. And um, why is it that the alpaca, the, um, you know, I, maybe it's closer to a, uh, to a camel or something, I don't know, but why is it that the, this all goes hand in hand it, it always loops back in it's crazy i can ramble about almost anything and it'll it'll loop back in because the alpaca okay which is the domesticated equivalent of the goat the mountain goat in south america what did they name that thing the alpaca alpaca the alphabet the alphabet it's it this is you know goats domesticated animal and phonetic alphabets go hand in hand in hand it's like a yeah. left yeah it reminds me of a left and you know the the beginning of the alpha and the, the mm -hmm. alphabet for sure yeah yeah and the largest and oldest your greek, skeletons come that's from... your greek word right there that's your greek connection alpha alpha yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's um taurus has a similar overlay is there too because you know you got the same phonetics but also you're talking about two different symbols. You know, a left is technically a bull's head. But what if it was an alpaca? I mean, I guess it's obviously like we keep saying, the symbols, the symbols change as you go to different parts of the world, but they they have the same phonetic base, right? So, and, you know, they, there were 50, not 50, sorry, there are 12-foot tall alpaca skeletons found in Arizona. And they believe the oldest alpacas in the world come from Arizona. You know, Arizona, again, you know, the, the Tijan Druids of the Ari, you know, the oldest, um, the oldest standing stones are in Arizona. Crazy. You know, they're gone now, but. So, you, think... um, you don't have an iPhone, do you? No. Right. No, so... you, you sent me nothing on, on Instagram. I think. Yeah, I that's it. 
It's not going to go through on, um, on text. How about this? It's a pretty good audio file. Yeah, I definitely I... want to hear it, but maybe since we can't, you just give us a synopsis, maybe? How about I try playing it through the mic? That sounds great. It, it, because... That's better than nothing. I've got a pretty good mic. And if it sounds terrible, let me know and I'll just I'll summarize it like you said. Okay. But I really like the audio. Yeah. Let's give it a go. Now it's not even playing on your on your iPad. Yeah. Such a faux pas. Oh, that's funny. Oh my god. Technical. Give this man another bomb rip. There was all sorts of fountains. There we go. Some are beautiful. Some. It sounds okay. So. Of course, there are all sorts of fountains. Some are beautiful. Some are purely mythological. Some are silly fountains. Of course, the silliest of all. The fountain of youth. Old Ponce de Leon thought that one was somewhere down in Florida. Well, actor Orson Welles never found it, but lots of Floridians claim that the fountain of youth is in their town. Punta Gorda, for instance. Margaret Baumhart, who lives nearby in Charlotte Harbor, may not be totally convinced, but she's a big fan of the Punta Gorda fountain. She remembers how popular it was around 40 years ago. Oh, yeah, you had to wait in line to get the water. But in the 1980s, the Punta Gorda fountain was tested using guidelines set by the Clean Water Act. What they found almost closed the fountain for good. It turned out the water contains an unusually high level of radium, around nine picocuries. That's about double the EPA's recommended maximum. In other words, the water is radioactive. After that discovery, the town of Punta Gorda put up a sign to warn visitors. Well, I think a lot of people have been scared off by the sign on the well. I don't know anybody else who actually gets the water there anymore. Well, that sign may be scary, but it seems a little bit of radioactivity might not be all bad. Uh, having a glass of water from the fountain is certainly not dangerous or even very risky. That's Zoltan Sabo, a researcher at the U.S. Geological Survey. He has tested thousands of wells around this country. He says the radium level in the Punta Gorda fountain is high, but that does not mean it's not safe. If that was your drinking water well and that was the only source of water you had and you drank it for 70 years, even then you'd only have about one in 20,000 risk. But Margaret Baumhardt has been drinking it for more than 40 years. I'm 88. Well, I just drink it and I cook with it and I make the coffee and the tea and things like that. But according to Sabo's math, even she is not in danger. In fact, the water may have something that helps to prolong life, magnesium sulfate, which is very good for your blood pressure, your heart, doesn't smell that great, though. Well, it has that sulfur smell, you know, that smells like rotten eggs. But Baumhardt says the smell does go away in a few days, and the water is just too good to give up. It may not be the fountain of youth, but she still loves that water. You know, I get a lot of flack about getting the water, but I still like to go get it. Only way I can describe it is as refreshing and invigorating. They have Fantastic. It. I, I love just it. found that today. That's great. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, for anyone that hasn't heard me and Longo talk about this endlessly, and, you know, I've made quite a few posts about it. I've started a series on it. It's just highlighting everything we've been saying. Right. And, you know, we I postulated that he wasn't looking for or he, he you know, he knew the fountain of youth was there. You know, the Turkish um, in my Colorado episode, I talked about that. The Turkish bath has its roots in Colorado and that the Turkish bath is just a radium sauna. And it's just directly related. All these city centers were built around fountains, almost all of them. And the fountains were all radium springs. Did you say radium sauna? Yeah, correct. Oh, we're going to get we're going to get into that. Oh, could, you, uh, could you pull this photo up, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, Turkish baths, you know, and the sauna, you know, that was a big, 
when they talked about the 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 um, physical muster or might of the Moorish army in Seville and all over Spain, they often related it to their sauna therapy, and yes. their saunas were all connected to yes. radium radium springs. Okay. Yeah, sauna. absolutely. And then yeah, this yeah. this go, this goes right back to your your natives of Florida. You know, mm-hmm. your, sauna, your sauna is a Finnish word. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, 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 it's Phoenician. I mean, this is, and it's worldwide, actually. The Eskimos and, um, you know, even the Mi'kmaq and many different tribes all over America did the sauna. And often, Longo, as you would know, they, they threw cannabis on the rocks as well. So they had radiant oh, yeah. water. Sit the end fire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The jumping seeds. Yeah. Um, so right here is the picture of that spring that we were just hearing about. Fantastic. So it's just a little, it's a water fountain. It's not even really a spring. It's just a water fountain. It gets piped up to the top of this <laughs> There's little... There's a health notice. <laughs> fix- there is, yeah. Yeah, at your own risk, of course. Yeah, but it's still there. It's still open to the public, thank God. So if you're in the area, South Florida, Southwest Florida, Punta Gorda, uh, worth going to. There's actually some more here. <clears throat> please keep going. I've been, I'll For keep sure. rambling. So jump in, please. Can you still see my screen? I can. Yeah, absolutely. Can you make it bigger? Yeah, let me see. I don't know about that. I can see it. That's okay. I, it, oh, yes, oh, I can. There we go. Also. Perfect. Perfect. I'm going to get a water. Go for it. Twice the level of radium, like the recording said. Um, caution sign so many many people bring bottles to collect its water still to this day and one of my favorite holistic health experts um, Robert Morse Dr. Morse Mm -hmm. he is in Punta Gorda and this picture is a different hot spring This is a hot spring in Punta Gorda, Florida, like 50 years ago or so. Um, Well, let's talk about, you said the words sauna and radium together. Well, we'll get to that, but this is the Charlotte Harbor Estuary in Florida. Radium and radon in Charlotte Harbor Estuary, Florida. Would you look at that? Yeah. And, you know, for those who don't know, radon is just part of the breakdown of radium. And if you haven't seen that chain, we've talked about it on the show here before. You can just go look it up real quick on Google. Just go to the wiki even for for radium and you'll see the the half-life and the molecular breakdown of radium. And all of the materials and elements that come from it are incredibly remarkable. And radon is right below radium. Anyways, keep going. Pretty rad, man. Terrible. In estuary and coastal waters, dissolve radium activities. Yeah, yeah. Are typically higher. So remember on, on one of your episodes, we talked about that 1973 study where um, the most radium ever found on the equatorial belt was found in the Gulf Coast. And I've, you know, one of the first things that ever brought us together was me talking about how the Gulf Stream comes from a subterranean river that is heated by radium or volcanic action. The river river Alpheus. mm -hmm. And it's all it's all radium, you guys. Earthquakes, for the most part, there are there are different mechanisms, but most of it is radium is underground. It's constantly dissolving matter. That's just what it does. It heats, it it boils, it melts rock, 
everything. They're little molecular suns. They're raw. That's why it's yep. raw dium. It's an octave. Of, octave of gold. Right. Octave and, of gold. And I've talked to, to you and I've talked to Tone of Eve, maybe he's still in here. And I've postulated that the real, um, you know, alchemical story and transmutation wasn't led to gold, but it was led to radium. And mm. that lead is the only thing that right. can isolate radium. Well, and, it makes sense because you're going solid to right. gas. Exactly. Why, why go solid to solid? And, and when you flip it from gold into radium, this makes the Egyptian mythological story far more make a lot more sense also mm -hmm. it, it correlates a lot with you mentioned the goat capricorn and saturn well what was the story of saturn and the scythe right saturn consumed his children into physical matter as i've said before on your show saturn is lead and he's radium he's both ends right he's feet and head right our crown sorry right mm -hmm. is that am i right on that one correct me say it, say it again feet, saturn can be both the base and the crown right yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's that pathway. He's certainly the crown, but a yeah. lot of people attribute him to the root too. Right. Yeah. So that's what I mean, right? That's your lead. So mm -hmm. Saturn, yes. the, the mythological story of Saturn is he consumed me and you into physical matter. He slowed us down. He slowed mm -hmm. down the radium with lead. Lead is the yes. only thing that can protect you from radium or radiation. There are other yeah. things now, but this is a mythological story. Mm -hmm. Lead slows down the light, so they would keep the radium in it. And the slowing of it down, that's the speed of the radium that does the damage to the cells of the body. So when they give you an x-ray and they put the lead vest over you, they can still perform the x-ray, but it reduces, it slows that insane flicker rate vibration of the radium and how it that's what causes the damage of the cells basically implodes the cell mm -hmm. so the, the mythological story of saturn is he consumed he ate his kids he reaped the kids into physical matter led in your journey here in physical form is to raise right this is kind of the whole concept of the chakras and climbing the ladder jacob's ladder to the crown is radium that's my take. People disagree with me, but that's what I think. So that makes the most sense to me. What do you think? I mean, that makes sense to me. I agree. And when you look oh, yeah. at the, the, the transmutation story of lead to gold and what these alchemists were doing, it was really just radium. And the powder, the white powder or the yellow powder, that's not gold. Like when you, when you, when you listen to mineralogists and miners find radium, and the natives in, in, all over the Southwest who are painting their bodies in radium, it was it was canary yellow. It was a powder. It was a white or a, a, a yellow powder. And you imagine, like, you know, these they said that they would dance, the rain dance ceremonies. They paint themselves in radium paint. And that, mm -hmm. that was like, it like yeah. magnified them. It was like, yeah, the know, rain, rain comes falling down right away. Yeah, exactly. So any, anyways, cut me off. What are we looking at here? No, that's it. Article. I was just trying to Who's see if there's any any additional information that wasn't mentioned. But I have another article. I don't I don't have it on cue here, but it's going to be in my Fountain of Youth. Doing a whole new new Fountain of Youth video soon. My last one was not good, uh, but the new one will be better. And this is basically saying I've been talking to a Finn, a Finnish friend breaking down a lot of the place names in Florida into Finnish. Cool. I'm excited to hear about that. You told me that you were talking to this person, but. And the Suwannee River, mm. we broke down to the Sauna. Sauna, sa Sauna. Sauna is the original uh, Finnish word uh, that went out. Lots of things. It has Una, the Sa, there's different components to the word that, that prove that it basically goes back to a, um, it's a vital to polar people. This is why Finnish people were able to thrive and maintain a, tro a tropical lifestyle because they spent at least an hour a day 
yeah. in the song in the song mm -hmm. whereas yeah. the the outer bands of europe did lost touch with the sauna culture now you're saying the turks uh, yes had um turkish bath culture bathhouses and various the romans took cultures. all of that the greeks of course yeah. right you can trace but, the sauna of course i agree with you 100 percent. it comes from the north mm -hmm. and through trade it worked its way just like everything else all around the world you can follow the sauna and phonetics everywhere mm -hmm. yeah we've got the swanee river in florida mm -hmm. now before i knew anything about this radium um i was looking into it just off of the phonetic link right there suwani sauna i've been passing that river um since i was five you know growing up going to north florida passing the suwani river well the suwani as i was saying talking with my finnish friend we connected to sauna and it just so happens on the Swanee River, there is a shit ton of steam parlors, you know, steam houses built mm -hmm. up, built up rock um, facilities for bathhouses, saunas, steam room, you name it, whatever it is. There was a bathhouse that had it and a Moorish hotel to go along with it more often than not. And a lot of those were burnt down <clears throat> around 1900, 1920. But basically, well, Flagler doing... himself and Rockefeller yeah. were massive hot spring, bathhouse, sauna, mm -hmm. obsessive. So, oh, yeah. No coincidence yeah. there. I mean, Rockefeller, no. Rockefeller owned radium hot springs from California to Florida all the way up into uh, New York even. So he knew it was up. And the yes. sanitarium, I mean, people have seen these videos and that, that term shouldn't be too unfamiliar to people in this kind of niche um, environment. And, you know, the whole Tartaria stuff that kind of got looped into it all. But all the sanitarium was, was dealing with rheumatism and all these things through either inhalants or through water. And it was all radium-based. Yeah. You won't find much literature connecting the sanitarium to radium, but there's there's some of it out there, but that's all they were. All the sanitariums and the mental asylums and all these things were converted, kind of inverted would be the best mm -hmm. word. Turned into spas, like retreats, getaways, Correct. whereas yeah. before it was more of a real deal healing yeah. inst institution. And people were traveling whereas, all, of, all over the world right. to come to these places. Yeah, it became more of like, oh, come relax, you know. Yeah. Got a bus got a business trip in the area. Oh, let the wife go hang yeah. out with her friends at this place. Exactly. Whereas twenty years earlier, they were curing cancer out of some of these places. They were exactly. curing you everything. Know, yeah. Diabetes, uh, you name it, rheumatism, um, anything, breathing problems, asthma. I mean, we're yes. talking like a, a weekend at this these places and these people. There was. There was a um, a cave in Colorado where people were healed instantly. Mm -hmm. the, the radium levels were so high. Yes. You know, now, people... I was bringing up sauna and Suwannee. Yeah. The reason I was talking about the Suwannee River, which, by the way, if you've ever heard anyone outside of America, like think of America 50 years ago, they almost probably stereotyp stereotypically could hum the tune of the Suwannee River. Okay, I forget the name of the song, but um, shit, I forget who it's by too. But anyone who's older than me out there will know who the Swanee River, the, the song Swanee River is, and it's world famous. So people outside of America often know it better than Americans because it's like a, you know, uh, it, it's like a, a fake national anthem to non Americans. Like, not Americans are obsessed yeah, it's, with dollars. It's cliche to us, but it yeah. stands out to people that aren't American. So basically, the Swanee River, which is sung about, and the cargo cults in, in um, like the Pacific Islands, they sing the tune of On the Swanee River. 
So basically, blah, 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 why I'm talking about it is the Suwannee River, which has all these hot springs along it. And the water's very, this is not one of Florida's picturesque springs. This is more of like a sulfur, a sulfury, yellowy, um, dirty looking, way down upon the Suwannee, maybe, that I'm seeing in the chat. But um, way down upon the Suwannee River, whatever. But um, it's got, it's blah, blah, blah. I'll get to the point. It's packed full of radium. Okay. Like that little, the fountain said two times the, uh, you know, e EPA's allowed limit for radium. This mm -hmm. is like five times or nine times. It was crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the whole river is just pumping out this radium. And it says that it's pumping out 200 million gallons of radium spiked water into, I don't know if that's per year, if that's since they, since they detected it, but the Suwannee river is oozing radium and anyone out there can go check this themselves oozing radium. So it's no coincidence that that's the river that they really, really, sunk their teeth into with the um spas the steam houses the you get it yeah mm -hmm. and they're all still there all the ruins are, are still there for so many of these places and some of them are ancient looking ancient ancient like carved into the bedrock right on to the um almost like they are they're in a part of the river a lot of the times higher up on the bank where the rivers co come down significantly since the time those were in use or they've been dammed off higher upstream yeah yeah and they're pumping so much into the uh into the structures and a lot of those really famous you know when the tartaria thing was first going around you saw all those bathhouses and the swim houses and that's 90 percent of it was radium oh um, yeah and that's what it was and like you already touched on lightly there is it was turned into this kind of vacationy thing Whereas before it was very much like almost religious, right? And, you know, anyone seeking, not just, you didn't need it to be sick. You know, this was just like part of life as you addressed already with, you know, the Finnish and, and you know, Norwegian culture. So much of the, the Northern, um, you know, Viking, quote, Viking culture. I mean, look at, you know, you've, you've shown this, like, what is a Phoenician shape? Well, it's a Morris ship and it's a Viking ship. And, and then you find all the overlays with the saunas and the language and the, the, the mercantile studies of this. And you find all three of these uh, phenotypes, phenotypes, aliens in the Gulf of Mexico. And, um, yeah, kind of shrinking again the window of time, you know. And you mentioned Got in Gotland, and this—that's an important place, right? Too, because I think that's a, a jumping-off point, right? Because the a huge Turkish capital <laughs> in the northern realm was Gotland, you know, no, no coincidence. And it's almost mm -hmm. identical. In it has radium springs. Um, yes. It's covered in Moorish architecture. Um, very, very ancient construction. It's, everything about it's like Florida. But in the can I can I cut in here a good Please. good um, comment in the chat from Richard Swami isn't it is as an in Indian Swami like master teacher you know guru yeah Swami his comment was Swami is an Indian name the country not Native Americans true now also people who like the Bach saga know the the significance that the swan plays the swan or a swan would turn into the word swan would turn into the line of Sven Sven, which is where you get words like Sweden, Swabia, Switzerland, Swaz, something else, but, um, you know, Swa, swan and Sven, which is where you get Sweden, Sweden. So, and by the way, Sweden, which I'm always talking about in Finnish, is the same thing. Finland is the Finnish line, and Sweden is the sweet Eden. Sweden is, I mean, come on, it's right there. Sweden is the Eden. Yeah. That's just the, the northern um, central garden, the four-sectioned garden, the Mount Maru garden. But um, 
one other yeah, thing in that I've, symbol that you lightly touched on there you know the the swath um is another yeah. great relation to everything we've been saying and swami as well right because the swami you know is a similar correlation to khan you know there was it was used as a title just like khan rex mm -hmm. and you find all these same people in india superior which is mexico and um you know sanskrit is found in the gulf some of the oldest um um representations of sanskrit are found in the gulf on the yucatan same with chinese and remember we talked about that article i sent you where in the 1800s they completely changed the chinese language and just made it a melting pot of all these different languages and when you look at ancient chinese the hieroglyphics version of it it has more of a correlation to micmac and etruscan and yeah, this is Sweden, Sweden, good comment there. Sweden, southwest of Eden, which yeah. uh, nice. uh, that's a good one. Yeah. I like that. So, Anyways, um, yeah, I, what do you got you here? Up, could you just uh, if you throw up these pictures, this is what I was. So, uh, these are all on the Swanee River, these bathhouses, <clears throat> these are steam room bathhouses. This one they can fill up on the inside. Wow. Here. Yeah, this and, this for those of you that have seen a lot of these images of these bathhouses that go from New York to to San Diego, California, they're all over. This is what they were like and this is they were all they, all of them were mineral mm -hmm. springs, quote, mineral springs, radium springs. This this looks like it's either 1919 or 1914. Yeah. It looks like but um this one is this one on the outside. This is the outside the spring house on the Swanee River. This is White Springs or White Sulphur Springs, it's sometimes called. So that's yeah. the inside. It's that's like that the... powder I was telling you about that the mm. you know all these different cultures used. You know, it was either white or yellow powder. Right. They, right, used, right, they, made, yeah. they made pigments with, and it was but, often mm -hmm. a sulf sulf sulfuric residue. Let, yeah. You boil off some of these waters. You know, you boil off tap water. You're left with like all this, the sodiums. Yeah. And, and stuff. In all the, the minerals. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, if you boil hard, off, hard water, right? It's mm -hmm. just mineral rich. So let's, this is a different one. This is a more, uh, I'm hesitant to say um, primitive because it's not primitive. I mean, this is really well made. The artwork it's very is Roman, very well. It's still standing today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And when the, you see a Roman you know, bathhouse, they look just like this, and they're often sub basement level. Mm -hmm. This is on the Swami. This you can is see the river a, running right in there. Yeah, it has a flow, so it yeah. it feeds in up through the ground right here, and then it feeds out into the river as well. And there's lots of different spots like that on the swanee so the swanee sauna i mean come on that's a native american word swanee river and a finnish word or phoenician swana yep. sauna mm -hmm. you know that's that's a dialect difference not even a language difference that's a dialect but uh um, yeah i mean it's undeniable when we've made enough of these phonetic bridges now on every episode we mentioned the phoenicians pretty much every single time um here's yes. that article i wanted to mention i'll just roll through real quick this is from an ohio newspaper in 1906 colorado caveman had his turkish bath nature provided unique vapor cavern where he could treat his ills the colorado caveman had his turkish bath provided him in nature's expense at nature's expense natural bathhouses much frequented by health seekers in the summer months are the unique vapor caves in the perpendicular Ooh. rock walls of the Grand River at Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Three great crevices in the walls lead a few yards into the mountain and there widen out into small rock apartments. Hot mineral springs bubble in the floors of these rooms, whence arise clouds of steam, causing the air to fairly reek with sulfuric vapors. Oh. 
The caves were formerly used and extensive by the medicine men of the of the time and other southwestern tribes. Ute, sorry, the Ute of American Indians. Here they carry the sick braves to sweat them. The first white settlers discovered the caves by noticing Indian blankets hung over the openings to them. They have been kept by the health company, which now owns them just as nature formed them, except that wooden gratings have been placed above the springs for floors and benches have been put in. The vapors are so impregnated with chemicals, the damp walls hang with the sulfur and salt. The curative effects of the caves for rheumatism and a number of other diseases are remarkable. So intense is the heat that patients are allowed to remain in but a few moments at a time. So, yeah. And I got tons of these. You know, we did our radium elixir life video together. And, you know, I've done a few episodes now. And, um, yeah, we're going to get into Nazis who were stealing radium, what they were doing with it how obsessed the Thule society was with radium that they mm-hmm. basically called it the elixir of life as well. And might, that might be why they kept sending their submarines into South Florida. Remember when you mentioned that. And now since you said that, I'm going to hop into my Atlantis Gulf article real quick. Mm-hmm. But I remember when you mentioned that, I said, I bet you they're using the radium water to power the subs. So for anyone that hasn't seen my talks with Longo or any of my radium work, a byproduct of radium is helium. Helium was first discovered when they started experimenting with radium. So we're talking about root races and Blavatsky. And then when you study enough theosophy and, you know, Edgar Cayce and these Atlantean myths will say the same thing. They had a crystal based technology. And when you put crystals next to radium, the crystals absorb it like a battery, like a lead battery. And they can be discharged like a laser. So you could focus the energy from a crystal that's, that has absorbed a radium light. And every crystal, all the different kinds of crystals, absorb the radium in different ways. Mm-hmm. But also when we're talking about perpetual motors, radium is doesn't, I mean, its half-life is you know, almost, you know, forever, essentially, millions of years. So you could create a perpetual machine. This is what I think steam the old world steam engines were. They used radium. They would never run out of power. And why some of these steam, the old, old steam engines were so heavy in that they used lead. People were like, why would they need lead? Well, but the pressures would get so high that you would have to, you would need a, you know, lead to contain it. I I think they needed the lead to contain the radium and that they could, you could make endless steam with this, right? Yes. And then a byproduct of the radium is your helium to keep you afloat, right? Yeah, you only you only need a chicken McNugget sized uh, oh, piece not of radium even that. A to pinhead. get you going. Yeah. yeah, a pinhead. Yeah, they said a, a, a pinhead could power uh, the largest ship in the world at the time. The Titanic, essentially, but it was a different named ship at the time. Titanic hadn't been built yet. But they said it could power a ship, you know, 800 feet long. And whatever the yeah. the tonnage was on a pinhead. You know, we got to do some digging into Laramar. Laramar. Because, you know... Is that uh, a place? That's the place. Laramar right? is the Atlantis stone. It's, yeah. uh, it's a rare stone. Oh, look at this. We got a little Laramar right here. Laramar. Hmm, interesting. Shit. Yeah, it's we not will. Good, not good light. Yeah, we could do a whole show just on crystals, especially with the radium stuff, because it's oh wow. Let's see. No, it's not good. Translucent, kind of see through. Yeah, blue. Not see through. Yeah, that's it's like it's like turquoise crystal. mixed with um turquoise. Mixed with, I don't know. Yeah, and, and uh, I know I know all the things I've rambled on about over the time that we've been talking, but they had the best luck with diamonds. They said diamonds were the best um, medium for absorbing radium. They held the light in the most, um, what was the word they used? Stable. Diamonds were the most stable um, crystal, quote crystal, 
for radium. And then when they impregnated a, a diamond, it turned orange. Hmm. Just like the orange. And that was where I first got the idea that I threw about to you. And then later through our studies, we connected more dots that they kept finding radium and iridium and all these things and citrus predominantly, right? And why we made the connection between royalty and the Moors and the Moors' obsession with taking oranges from Florida and planting them in Spain and all over mm -hmm. actually Europe. The big connection there, right? Oh, yeah. And that many of the orange groves in Florida are side by side with a radium spring and that most yes. of them get their water from subterranean radium springs and that the orange, orange is just absorbing the radium and that's what gives it the color. It's the best. It's God's best distillate dis, uh, distillation device for those super, super strong trace minerals. I agree. Yeah. Structural. Metals. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. The, some of the best orange uh, groves in the world were on top of the Lake Wales Ridge, which is this strip going up the center of Florida that is comprised of like pure African sand. <clears throat> it's aeolian, or radium, aeolian iron rich magnetic sand. And this is where it price precisely where the lightning capital of the world is. So if you take the whole country, a whole country, Venezuela's the, the highest country. If you take the, for lightning strikes, you mean? Yeah, for lightning strikes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, if yeah, you, yeah. That, you, that lake or bay there that gets lightning mm -hmm. like every day, pretty much. Yeah. But if you take the strip from Tampa Bay to Titusville, Florida, that if you view the statistics a certain way, can be crowned the lightning capital of the world. And that Fantastic. Uh, that cross-sections exactly with this red iron sand, not from Florida, just like the quartz sand in CSTP, right. that's, that's yeah. not from Florida, that's from Appalachia. Mm. Well, now there's, there's African sands too that's red. You can mm. see this on Google Earth if you look at Florida, top down or north south running there's a strip a perfect tear almost like a machine gun shot straight up and down florida and right in the middle and basically that's iron rich red sand from africa the iron rich red sand has to be playing into the lightning phenomena and the bermuda triangle phenomena yeah. And why are both the there's parts in Florida where the white sand starts, sorry, the white sand stops and the red sand starts like in a flat layer, perfect line, yeah, yeah. And it's like, what atmospheric change happened? Yeah, where you had one day you have a white dune and the next day you have a red dune, you know, electricity. Mm -hmm. A sure. ma plasma plasma, plasma oh, yeah. event where there's a, a shift in the magnetic charge of an area. But we're getting on the last half hour here. You want to get uh, get some calls in? Yeah. Yeah. And really quick before I lose my, my what I was going to say there. Um, when you study fulgurite, right, which is the... Oh, you're going to like my video tomorrow. Uh, they have, they find radium in fulgurite. And what is fantastic wow. about Fulgrite. Oh, JJ Dreamers, thanks for joining us. <clears throat> Perfect guy to have in the channel um, right as we start to talk about this. So when you study Fulgrite and you study petrified trees, you find very similar crystallization, right? So you have a tree that got struck by lightning and was petrified. And you have Fulgrite sand. When you study sand and how certain organic materials become sand i.e large trees when a tree gets hit by plasma it can become sand so you have like two similar substances so trees can become petrified and part of the tree can become sandstone or sand right similar concept yes yep. is the desert and fulgurite and from an elemental standpoint, they're very, very similar. And all of the petrified forests, the standing forests, 
in the southern states and i've been covering petrified forests in every one of my anomalous videos from oregon all the way down here we are in tomorrow's episode where you have petrified forests some of these trees are 600 thousand to a thousand feet tall so we're dealing with ancient forests right that are much bigger and this is partially where the radium streams in my opinion are coming from when you look at the literature on mining and the the terminology again since me and you are always talking phonetics the terminology for mining is almost identical to an organic structure i.e a tree they're very similar so when you're talking about these different veins and the way they are constructed, the way a, a petrified tree can be turned into 80% copper or 80% silver, right? It all depends on the, the humidity in the air when that tree got hit by lightning or by plasma or whatever the event was, right? That they make a different substance. And every tree, since we were talking about oak and we, me and you have been talking behind the scenes about all these different trees and how they were, there was a language built around the trees. And all of the trees communicated different languages and had different, were made of different substances, different crystals. Their sap was worshipped like blood. Well, sap of a tree, when it's hit with plasma, it petrifies into all these minerals. And gold and silver exist in the sap, just like in a human body. When a human is petrified, same thing. Heart. Mm -hmm. the, the, or, there's actually again. literal gold in the human heart. And it or when a organic, human or an organic structure is petrified, you find all these minerals. So the entire mineral kingdom, or at least that we speak of, the mineralogical kingdom from like a mining perspective, and these radium springs, I think, were, were the funnels of old trees, right? And when you can find these table mountains where they have waterfalls, the scientists, you know, especially in the desert, they go, there's no rainfall up there to designate this waterfall and that they hypothesize the water is somehow being pumped to the top and flowing down and when you study trees and how trees um, basically use a vacuum through mm -hmm. sap sap moves downward creates a vacuum and draws water up the tree that would be in my opinion from a biological standpoint the only way to explain some of these if, things and radium petrificate petrifactions of living organisms and radium go hand in hand and California or Florida is seeming more to me like a giant petrified organism of some kind that was where I was going with that so yeah before we run out of time to take some calls let's do that sure uh, you're gonna have to do it you take the link and you just post it in the chat like share Inv the invite, invite link link and you just post it and if you're if you can post for my channel even better too <clears throat> okay post good post. done yeah in the meantime good uh, comment from d nico could green eyes be radium yes the radium the green eyes the um the rarest air <clears throat> the rarest eye color that goes hand in hand with red hair often Green eyes, red hair, yeah. like real green eyes. Well, you'll my wife see... is a redhead and she has green eyes. Nice. So you'll see that green eyes is like a milky, yellowish, or a greenish um, ink kind of being cast onto blue eyes more often than not. And uh, this, when you get into iridology, they attribute green eyes and green color hazelness to sulfur to Ooh. sulfur in iridology oh yeah, now what, what what were we just talking about yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah. the connection between sulfur radium yep. radon this the water that has the radium in it is the one that smells like sulfur yeah so um and and going back to fulgurite some fulgurite becomes iridescent and glows green and Yes. It was popular yep. in, Greece. Yes. in wow. Grecian times. They made vases with glass impregnated with radium that would glow. And you would drink. This was the, uh, what's that cup? That mythological cup of life, right? Holy Grail? Remember. Holy Grail. Okay. The Holy Grail for me is a radium cup 
that when you put your water in it, the radium impregnates the water, and that's your revitalizing your elixir mm-hmm. of life. So, and you can find again anyone that doesn't follow me, you can just search my posts uh, on Twitter, and I have a whole big breakdown on the radium glass and how that was a huge fad all through Europe in the 1700s, 1800s. I'm posting the link now um, in both of our chats. When I posted it in just yours somehow because I'm dumb. All right. Oh, thank you so much, Jay. I'm glad that you uh, resonate with what I was saying there. And if you don't know Jay Dreamer's channel, he he's like the petrifaction wizard. You know, his stuff is incredible, and I agree with a lot of it. But, yeah, the links right. are here in chat now um, to join. So, yeah. Thanks for sticking with us, guys. And, you know, uh, hopefully you're enjoying the material. 630 people. Holy shit. Yeah, we're going to have to, like, you know, kind of break these things down so we can do a little bit more of a focused discussion. Because as always, after these lives with you, we walk away with more things to talk about than we kind yes. of took off the table. <clears throat> now, if if someone's, um, while people call in, um, you mentioned fulgurite. My video premiering tomorrow is all about fulgurites, crystals forming in clamshells in Florida that occur nowhere else in the world except Florida. Calcite crystals inside of clamshells. Look, Look it up. Clamshell calcite. Then you have the red sand playing into the fulgurites, the highest, most concentrated fulgurite um, site on the planet is this Lake Wales Ridge that I was just talking about with the lightning alley going through it where they cross and the red sand is underneath lightning alley is where the fulgurites are preserved forever because it hits the sand and boom it's preserved it's a fossil it's there forever and then yeah. you just go up you go up with a scraper not even a you don't even have to dig they go up to the side of the hill and they yeah. just rip rake it with like a plastic like sand beach tool yeah the fuck the fulgurites just fall out by like the dozen it's, I it's absurd it. it's crazy. In my, you'll see it tomorrow but you just to wrap it all together in florida there's fulgurites fulgurites are pretty amazing in their own right but one on the west coast of florida near tampa bay and just north of where i showed um Punta Gorda earlier, you have Newport Ritchie. It's Newport Ritchie that the story came out of. A fulgurite, so a lightning bolt came down, struck a tree. I believe it's an oak tree. I haven't confirmed it, but it's an old tree in Newport Ritchie. The thunderbolt hit the tree, okay, formed a fulgurite. It was favorable conditions for one to form, and it formed in the tree or just under the tree. I I don't really know. A guy went out there, expert for a professor at USF, University of South Florida. He went there, bought the fulgurite from the guy. They put it under a microscope, okay? It's it's, um, non-replicating, non-Earth-like material. So it's literally an alien material from space. They're, they're, of course, they're saying words like space, and this comes from meteorites. They say the only other place they find things like this material is on meteorites. So the meteorites material coming down in a lightning. Fantastic. Hole. We're going to, yeah, touch- once this is all stuff I plan on talking about in my radium series that scientists yeah. were saying, look, meteorites are just radium and that comets are just radium and why they don't burn out. And you can see them um, continually projecting the same amount of light over all of these different periods when they return is because they're made of radium and they, they aren't, uh, there's no decay. And that several times with the correct equipment, you can see that, that they're just green and that the atmosphere is changing the color of the, of the um, the meteor, the comet, and remember we talked about the Egyptian narrative of their foundings that they rode on the the meteorite, mm-hmm. right, and landed in the Yucatan. Right. You know, there's, and, and this relates to Atlantis, like we talked about, right? The first king of Atlantis was was a meteor, 
or the Ben Ben stone, right? The Ben Ben worship stone comes from Atlantis. Atlas ropes, fucking yeah. literally yeah. where, literally where I was just talking about Newport Ritchie. Mm-hmm. Okay, Newport Ritchie, where John Saxer took us to see the Atlas stone sitting in front of the restaurant with yeah. the two two faces on it. Mm-hmm. That's the exact exact same city. Wow. That I was just talking about with the Atlas stone, with Atlas and Hesperus, yeah. their faces on their Adam and Eve Atlas. Yeah, and the Atlas story that resonates so clearly with the, the dung beetle of the Egyptians, you know. And, you know, the beetle was venerated as the sun disc with the beetle. And to mm-hmm. me, I, I've broken down, in my opinion, again on my Twitter, that that was a symbol of radium and its decay, its half life. And that, the actual scarab beetle shell is completely comprised of bismuth and bismuth is just one of the breakdowns of radium and bismuth is the most um electrical free flowing electrical transmutation right. uh, mineral that exists yeah we were talking bismuth last time we were together yeah and that the, yeah. that solar disc with the scarab beetle is just an alchemical symbol for radium and the elements that come from radium but yeah so we're running out of time. You want to pull someone in here? Oh, uh, it's up to you. I can't. I can't. You have. You yeah. control it. Alex, you there? Hey. Good evening. Hey. What's up, welcome. Alex? How are you? Doing well. How about you both? Good. Thanks for joining us. What's going on? Yeah. Well, I was just thinking about kind of the origin of citrus trees. Oh case. yeah. Super and interesting. And also. Yeah, twofold. I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Longo, if you've been to Philippi Park in Safety Harbor. No, um, not yet. Not yet. That's the uh, Tamukua Mound with the uh, blessed, blessed um, hurricane protection, right? Yep, there's that. And basically, the downtown's organized around the Safety Harbor Spa that has mm. healing waters, and they even bottle it. And uh, there's an article online explaining that there were some old uh, Spanish maps that called Safety Harbor the Bay of Pounce de Leon. And they say mm-hmm. that he was actually shot by um, the Togabagas with a poisonous dart and then ended up dying in uh, Cuba. But, you know, I find it really interesting because I love St. Augustine. I think it's so cool, but like how it's, you know, it's, 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 the nation's oldest city, but really the oh, yeah. safe harbor. Yeah, you know, seems interesting. But anyways, I you know I'm trying to keep it simple with that and the origin of citrus trees because supposedly Philippi Parks, named after this uh, Odit Philippi, who was a surgeon supposedly in Napoleon's huh. army, and they say that he introduced grapefruit to Florida. Wow. Yeah, but, but overall, thanks thanks to your videos, you know, I've kind of thought a little differently that maybe citrus was here. You know, back in the yes. world, the well, lost tribes of Florida. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> no, good. Great topics, Alex. Thank you. Um, you know, you've actually got the closest thing to a sweet orange. They'll tell you in the Wikipedia. And in my video, I said um, that the sweet orange does not occur in the wild. It does not. The various types of sweet orange that we know do not occur in the wild. Yeah, well, they're all hybrids. Yeah, the closest thing to a sweet orange, though, however, has been found recently, like the last five years, flourishing out in the wild, like 20, 20 tall foot trees. It grows tall, straight up, and it, com- it competes for um, light in a dense canopy, which is like a super good sign. You know, like it's thriving in a... I don't know. I'm not a plant guy, but basically, well, dappled it, light, you know, you know, lower canopy light. Yeah, but it'll push through all the way to the top, which is um, it shows that it it has like a a memory, a genetic memory of competing, like in these conditions, you know, Florida like con- conditions is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Tropical. It, 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 know, yeah, but... it knows what to do in its innate DNA, even though our science hasn't seen this species of orange yet you got everyone look it up who, who's ever into orange look up new wild because they're worried because the orange um industry is kind of going in the shitter 
re- recently. Yeah. Greening, um, and then, yeah, well, that's what they'll say. That's the easy, that's the simple explanation. It's not as simple as that. You know, if you had, if you didn't have two massive like monopolies on the uh, orange juice business in Florida, you probably wouldn't have that issue to begin with. But, mm. but you know, you get it. Yeah. Th- well, thank you for that. I mean, sure. I don't want to up, man. Yeah too much of your time but i mean i in 2014 i became a docent on Kauai for the national tropical botanical gardens and that was a big part of the education of the difference between a, a native forest and invasive and just how there's some right. plants come from very competitive ecosystems and then they get introduced to a native ecosystem and just start out competing the native plants and such but mm-hmm. hadn't really thought about it in the way that you mentioned it for sure yeah get over there man check out safety harbor it's pretty cool i will looking forward to looking forward to a meetup in the tampa bay area there there will be once this expedition is over this whole road trip but yeah thank you so uh, much man you've been really pumping out a lot of good videos and i wish i could have tuned into more of this um discussion but hey i saw you know you guys were letting guests in so Thanks for letting me share. Yeah, oh, thanks. Shelia. Thanks for calling. Wonderful information. Have a good one, yeah. man. Yeah, the you history of, of citrus fruit and, and the orange and, you know, Longo's done a great job of this. And we talked about uh, some of the uh, ancient queens of Florida and Mexico who their sacred fruit was the orange. And as like peace and gifts of expression, they'd offer oranges. Mm-hmm. And you find this same culture existing with the Moors. The Moors took all of this orange and citrus culture to Spain and it flourished it's, there. And you find it's it in the France. alchemical fruit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think it's the symbology again and the healing powers of radium. It's it's so it's like an onion. There's so many layers to it. You know, the saunas like we talked about and the radium, um, the Turkish baths and the Greeks got all this from them and you know. Where did the Greeks find their origins? You know, you mentioned St. Augustine in Longo. We've talked about this so much. You know, the St. Augustine may have just been one of the Greek capitals of Florida. That's what it seems more likely to be. But yeah. Well, All right, Alex. Here, here we're gonna, we're gonna bring in All right. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Until next until next time. Thank you. Thanks for calling in, man. Uh, You're welcome. Have a good one. Keep 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 up the good work. Thanks, Thanks Rob. I will. Thanks. All right, Morgan. Well, uh, Hello, guys. Yes. Very long ago. Um, What's up, Morgan? I am always astounded at the fact the bones of Elijah. I know I'm bringing a little bit of uh, the Bible into this, yet uh, the accounts are in 2 Kings 13, 21. The men are out. And you guys know with the chariots, right? And the wheel within the wheel mm-hmm. um, of Elisha and all that. Yeah. Uh, so oh, those guys, the one guy's bones. They're out, and they buried them from the other people, their enemies. A guard is out, and they got to hide. they got to kill the one guy home. <laughs> they bury it. Where are we going to put him? Because, because there's more people coming. Okay? You get it. More people coming, right? We just killed these guys. What do we do? Put him in, put him in Elijah's tomb. Put him in Elijah's tomb. Oh, can we do that? Like, yeah, yeah, go ahead, because we got to hide. God. It's like that, you know what I'm saying? It's practical. It's like, no, no, we can break every single freaking rule. We got to go away. <laughs> so they go, and these men, they've already bound up. They bring them down in there. It just, they had, and the one guy trips. Okay, that's what it said. They go, he trips. The body goes, touches, touches Elijah's bones. Like, just, they're back. Boom, boom, he's alive. Right back to, like, bang, I am awake and, like, vibrant now i think exactly what they wanted when he wanted to find the holy grail those bones either in part or where is the mineral fountains from them because if that, that's what a little bit does like in the green mile when the mouse when he made when he gave him the aging thing like like with the, the gift or whatever he goes, that's how long just a little, little bit of the mouse can make you live i don't know how long i might end up living in the same way yeah. the bones of elijah put in the ground but they are now they are in the ground. Those minerals are exactly what I believe causes people to heal. It's physical and where the spiritual meet. 
because it's also written in the word. It works that way in this realm. It, it's a gate. Somehow those minerals are in the ground now and, and providing the healing pools. And they still are to this day. And I think they're in Florida because everything points down to there. Like, you know what I'm saying? Turkey and whatnot. Either they're the sister thing or they are the same place in the same time because that's just a it's weird. I don't believe in space. I don't believe in time. Well, yeah. It, <laughs> Sorry, it, it, so it can bad, be but... it can be Titan. It can be Titan people. It can be giant trees. That, see, it can be many. That's things. why I wanted to bring it up so we can start expounding on the thought. I have that yeah. written down as well, thinking that that's what they're doing. That's the idea of the rich guys, and that is we want to get down there. We want to be breathing the same air. We want to be bathing in the same, same water as the Titans of the Titans, so that we can gain as much of their essence truly as possible and so what you just said is exactly where my mind is like water my friend um that's yeah, wonderful. yeah well when they you have a like, little bit of audio issues more yeah you're breaking oh, up a little, little bit you're a little horrible floppy. horrible when you study reiki like the reiki masters light essentially it shoots from their hands and you know there's many there's many other practitioners of this but i think it's the same concept people could people have radium that's what brings us life there are many representations of radium all throughout the bible um it's and, radio and that yeah, yeah of course yeah it's the mess it's the, yeah the, the meaning it's is light. Of christ to, to, okay, it's vibration it's yeah. the highest yes. vibration absolutely a yeah. word which is the message the, yeah. the bittersweet symphony that is like that is the verb it's the Verb and the noun at the same time. Love, love yeah. is dead well, unless it is active. Yeah, phonetics. It is active and... radio. Okay, now I'm tripping out. What yeah. do you know what I mean? Well, tripping language, in. language. You know, the vocal voc l. The vocal cords are the square and compass of the masons, and when you yeah. speak your phonetics, grammar into the grimoire of magic into the ether, you are bringing it into the physical realm. Yep. Appreciate your comment and your call in, Morgan. We're going to get our last guy in here. Thank you so much dude, for listening. Morgan. Thanks, man. Appreciate when's, your, it. when's your birthday, my dude? Gotta know. November 13th. Yes, I am a Scorpio. Oh, fuck yeah. I know. Yes. Longo loves yeah. Scorpios. Oh, yeah. I saw a comment. Um, <clears throat> doctor's orders extra sloth milk for you. Okay. <laughs> extra sloth milk. Yeah. Oh, man. Right. That's so funny. I was talking about that today. Thank you, Morgan. Have a wonderful I'll night. Have a good night, Morgan. Hammock dude. Thanks for hanging in there, man. Hell you yeah. there? You in your hammock? We got John McAfee over here. Hammock dude. <laughs> if yeah, you have been chosen. What's up, brothers? What's going oh, on? Oh, right on. You were in your hammock. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm here. Hey, how's hammock it going? Dude. No, I actually I'm not in the hammock right now. But uh <laughs> well, pre pre appreciate you putting me in. Yeah, talk to us. <clears throat> it's all good, man. And I want. Oh, I got some kind of feedback. So you sound all good on our end. Um, yeah, you sound good. The reason why I'm a Dr. Longo, I know you're down with uh, the horoscope. I'm a oh, Scorpio, yeah. Scorpio with a Cancer Moon to kind of like throw you a little bit out there. Okay. Does it? Really? And continue. Sorry, it's my feedback, bro. Okay, no worries. And um, we were talking about minerals a minute ago, and I believe that I'm a huge advocate of the cellular salts in your own body. Oh, yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I believe if you pay attention to those, and if you... Sorry, bro. I got a bad feedback. <laughs> well, we're not getting any feedback, so that's that's a bummer. You sound perfect. It's probably just the shrooms you took a couple minutes ago. I don't know how to use them. I don't know how to use your machine. Sorry. It's okay. Cellular okay. salts. Where were you going with that? I'm Wait, hearing it replay in my head, and I can't Wait, follow the on. conversations. Kyle. Hang on. Are you me in the future? <clears throat> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading that as well. <laughs> no, I don't need that, actually. That's the loop. Is, um, with you. We're talking about radium. It's back to the future here. 
Marty, careful. You can't meet Marty in the future. When you pay attention to the cellular salts underneath your astrological signs oh, yeah. and the sign that you're born under, uh huh. <laughs> Sorry, we're we're just gonna mute. I'm gonna mute. Just you go. Is the feedback from us that helps you pick up your cross and follow? Because you know where you are. Okay. Thanks, dude. Yeah. Appreciate it, <laughs> Hammock. Thank you for calling in, man. Cell salts. I mean, I'll just pick up on, on yeah, that. Yeah, pick right up there. on that. Thank cell, you, Hammock. Cell salts is a big one for health, holistic health. And I talk, it's in the reincarnation process, the cell salts go underneath the tree and get absorbed into the tree. And when you're burned into ash, all that's left on the physical end, on the molecular end, yeah. is these cell salts, these 12 cell salts. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're burned butt naked, you know, no, no clothes, no rubber or shoes on, you know, just a human body, you're only going to get left um these 12 cell salts in ash form that's why all these religious texts say things like ash to ash or dust to dust why are they saying dust because it's it's the it's the um consistency of ash you know it's it's like a solid but when you touch it it's poof, it's gone you know so yeah well, yeah i love well. that remember we talked to about how sacred it was from the pagoda this tied in pearls that i wanted to mention earlier but totally forgot and how m pearls are magnetic and they're sacred for all of these different reasons they cleanse energy and all of these things and all the the giant cypress trees remember that all the giant burial mounds that the largest burial mound ever found in america folks is in florida 600 people with the at the time the largest cypress mm -hmm. tree that was left in florida in the late 1800s was on that's, top of them that's the capital and it's the avatar we talked about how the people would connect themselves with the tree and then when they passed on they they would be they would said they would be absorbed into the tree that's just what you're saying the ash and the tree they would be buried together is that Whedon island that you're talking about or is i that can't remember the name tarpon of springs area 600 skeletons was, yeah. sounds like tampa bay area it was tampa bay area so yeah. that that's probably the Whedon Island outside of Tarpon Springs. Um, basically, six hundred skeletons, if not more than that. I think I've seen up to a thousand on some reports, but yeah. there's six hundred for sure. Maybe six hundred with men a with a giant tree purposely skeletons. planted on top. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's right where John Saxer believes the capital seaport of Atlantis to be. Yeah. No coincidence. Well, and you've, yeah. and you know, someday we'll have to get into all those articles that we've shared with each other behind the scenes because most of them we haven't even shared with the people yet. But yeah, mm -hmm. Tampa Bay was a incredible place. You yes, know, the and, the tempo, the timpanies. It's the uh, you know the Florida Keys are the keys. Yeah. And Tampa was the tempo. It's the uh, the tambourine. You know, it's, it's uh, so to speak. And so the guy was talking about Turkey earlier, Florida has the keys. Eurasia has the Turks. So the Turks and the keys, the turkeys, Benjamin Franklin wanted the turkey to be, to be the American bird. Yeah. The American bird. Cause it's the Phoenix bird. They're saying what bird yeah. is most like a Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And they said, he, he said the Turkey. And did you see my, uh, Emperor Tigrinus, the founder of the Tijan race in Arizona, New Mexico. I, sorry, he mummified I, his turkey that he kept as a pet. Oh, and was, buried, uh, was buried with him. Yes, they are. Yeah. They are so familiar. You know, some animals are so used to people and will come so close to people. Yeah, come almost as if they're oblivious to the fact that we hunt them. Yeah, like, turkeys like, are the king of it. Exactly. Turkeys will just come right up to you. I don't care where as, they are. As if they're domesticated, as if yeah. they're a royal bird, a royal yeah. 
garden bird, you know. Like in a past age, they were sacred, so they could just go where they wanted. It's exactly. like peacocks today. My exactly. in-laws, their neighbors have peacocks, and I had peacocks on my last farm. And um, anybody that's ever seen the Little People Big World TLC show, popular show, it's about little people. They were my neighbors, and their peacocks would come in my yard all the time. And, um, yeah, same with peacocks. They just wander around like they, they own the place. It's so funny that you said that. I always thought that about them. Mm-hmm. Like, turkeys and peacocks don't give an F about anybody. <laughs> they're just asking to get hit by cars. They'll just stop a car in traffic. You could say they're foul. Yeah. So funny. Anyways, um, I love you, Longo. Um, love you and too, thank man. you guys, everybody, for tuning in. Make sure to let us know. You know, hopefully uh, you enjoyed this. And uh, what do you um, got? What do you got tomorrow? Tomorrow I have Anomalous in the morning, America, right? Yeah, a Nevada episode nine of Anomalous America comes out tomorrow in the morning. What time? In the morning. Yep, five a.m. is when I start my time. Five fifteen. I get up early with kids. I have to do it all before they wake up. So everybody's asleep now, and I got to wake up in a few hours. And I'll see you all again. Hopefully, a lot of you will be here. Nice. Um, it's so, been a great. It's going so well. I couldn't be happier with the series. Uh, um, like I told you long ago, I I organized a lot of my material in the states. You know, two two three years ago. So it's just been fun rereading some of the stuff I haven't even looked at in years and seeing how much of it resembles what me and you have talked about. It's been great. And uh, yeah. So and then uh, my full part of the Radium series comes out Thursday or Friday. It depends on baseball. Busy with my kids and baseball. And um, yeah, I'm thinking about starting a poetry series, like an audio book podcast type thing where there's no visuals and you can just listen to my material. I love poetry and I don't really know how else to share that besides just doing it in an audio format. But yeah, so I miss you and I hope we can get together and do some more videos together and hopefully you guys want the same thing. Um Oh yeah. So yeah. What about you? What do you got to say before we go? Well, uh, I'm going to be tuning in tomorrow morning um, to the archivist over here. And then at 8 PM, I've got a video premiering um, crystals, Atlantis and the gods and the gods of lightning. And we, we, inadvertently talked about a lot of the stuff that's yeah. in there tonight we'll have to do a show about ogham and the language of trees and the wood well what did why... you just say ogham both well, we were talking about vulcan yeah right mm-hmm. Fulgurites. yeah volcanoes and the mythos the... you know the finnish mythos and and thor and the oak tree and the elements that are tied into all of these mythological stories, you know, radium being a big part mm-hmm. of every mythological story has its radium and uh, plasma and lightning and fire, you know, the God of fire and Vulcanism is obviously very much tied into radium. And so is plasma. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's so much to chew on there. We could talk all night, but yeah, thanks everyone, especially you guys staying up super late. Longo, I thank you. And uh, yeah, what do you want to say to people before I sign off? Nothing. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Don't miss sure. uh, both of our shows tomorrow. And uh, you know, if, if we missed some of your wonderful comments, make sure to leave one on the video. And uh, yeah, thanks again for tuning in. Love you guys. Long go, sure. love you. Have a great night, love everybody. Too, Have a good thank night. You. Yeah, thank you. Bye, guys.